Okay, um, many people are calling me, texting me, Facebook messaging me, telling me it's over, we're dead, what are we going to do, where are we moving, all this other stuff. I will reiterate that I try to get up before you today and put on a happy face. I put on my Make America Great Again hat because I have not given up hope, nor should you, because the game is not over yet, and we still have a lot to do. Um, one of the things we do all the time on this show is try to give you different perspectives, um, bring on Democrats, Republicans, people of all different ilk, and uh, you make the call. We have thoughtful conversations, okay? Um, two of the best in the business that we have right here, David Eisenbach joins us. He's a historian, Columbia University professor, and uh, former Democratic candidate for public advocate. And Michael Johns comes back for a little double duty today, uh, former uh, speechwriter for President George H.W. Bush, co-founder of the Tea Party Movement. And uh, guys, you guys, um, David, he's in the world of academia, but he is a very, uh, in my view, open-minded Democrat. He was a Biden supporter. And Mike, you're all the way on the right there with the conservatives and the Tea Party. So you guys are about as diverse as they come. Um, I'd like to get both of your uh, take on Trump's speech last night. David, you're a presidential historian, so give us a little context on what we're facing here compared to other presidents and what you thought about when he came out last night and gave everybody a little update. Well, it was, it was the speech of a sore loser. It reminded me of Richard Nixon after losing... Uh, in California governor's race. Not, in Dave, but wait, wait, wait. Let, you see, we're trying to have thoughtful conversation. Has anyone lost yet? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, this, this thing is pretty much over. Guys. Well, wait. So, no, no, but the thing uh, is, again, I mean, you're, you're an you academic. Know, you're an academic. In right? Nevada, with, uh, Arizona, uh, I, I, you know, I don't do this a lot. I like you guys to duke it out. But let's not start with a bad premise. No one's lost the race yet, right? Can we agree on that? That, that is true, but okay. it's not looking good for you guys. Anyway, Agreed. you asked about the speech yesterday, and I'm telling you right now, it was Nixon, 1962, uh, complaining about the, how the press was responsible for his loss. It wasn't him. It was the press. And you're not going to have Richard Nixon kicking around in 60. Right. Hey, but Mike, that, um, <laughs> does Donald Trump have a right to make the argument that the press was against him? I mean, is there anyone seriously? I don't, you know, honestly, uh, I think the main, I, like seriously, the, I don't believe the mainstream media would uh, would even dispute that at this point. I mean, I talk to these guys a lot of times on the record, off the record, whatever. I mean, they uh, they really had it in for Trump from very obviously from the very beginning. They covered him completely in a biased way. They omitted and overlooked. And, de and demeaned his incredible successes and spent an extraordinary amount of time looking for scandal where there was none, including the most outrageous thesis when you think about it, that a president of the United States somehow would be colluding with a foreign power, uh, a hostile foreign power, to win that election, which, uh, you know, consumed what, you know, two, two, really two years of this entire administration. Um, I thought his presentation was measured. It was written, which I think is a good idea in a case like this. Because, you know, one of the things that if, I think if you're responsible at this moment, you want to certainly say there's no room for violence. I wish we'd heard more of that from the left when these street riots were going on. No room for violence, including on our side, including when, you know, individuals have even witnessed some of the most egregious violations of statutes and things that certainly seem to be suggestive of uh, fraud. You have to believe in the system that we're here to defend. And the system that we're here to defend does provide, um, you know, a judicial recourse in all these cases. That's why these suits have been filed. They're going to win some, they're going to lose some. And as it relates to the election, um, let's say a few things. Number, uh, Let me say a few positive things for those with more conservative persuasion. Number one, uh, presuming that Republicans hold the Senate, which I thought was a foregone conclusion and now apparently isn't, um, the uh, investigation into the Biden payments will continue uh, because that was started by Johnson and Grassley committees. That's very important. Um, I think ma many of us have an enormous degree of concern about millions, tens of millions of dollars flying into these 
the, that might be in. that might be scary too, but Mike, I mean, that might actually play right into their hands if Trump goes and proves that Joe Biden and Hunter are corrupt. They eliminate Joe, and then Kamala Harris is the president. It's almost a be careful what you wish for situation. Dave, I just want to come back to you. I know. I see that you're in a little bit of a celebratory mood today. How um, could I not be? My guy won. Who do you like most? What do you like most he about Biden? He killed it. What, what was, what's Biden? Let me ask you a question, guys. David. And David, let me Arizona. Ask, David, let me and ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. It's a huge victory for the Democrats. And Donald Trump is nothing but a sore loser who just needs to take the beating that he was handed on Tuesday night. What's your, uh, what do you think Biden's biggest accomplishment is in 47 years of high level federal service? Beating Donald Trump. That's, well, that's, not, that's not, as John correctly pointed out, that hasn't, ha that hasn't happened yet. Um, and, it's happening, and, my friend. It is happening. So let me just say, you know what? Uh, I find it, I find had, find it. enthusiasm for him before uh, the outcome of this. What was your enthusiasm based on? What, what, what did you see? I was just going to, I was just going to weigh in on that. That was so laudable. As, as a, uh, you know, an arbiter of fact here, um, and Dave's been a great guest for us for a long time. He's one of my good friends. Um, but he was a Joe Biden. He was a Bernie Sanders supporter. So he only newly jumped on the Biden bandwagon. So when he says, my guy won, I thought your guy was Bernie. Well, uh, my guy supported Joe Biden, and we supported him to get uh, here. Uh, all right. So your guy's uh, way, not guy too, won. Not too aggressively. Did you Trump notice that? Did you notice? You know, we didn't really talk about this because there are so many issues, but did you notice you didn't really see Hillary Clinton on the campaign trail? You didn't really see Bill Clinton on the campaign trail? No, we're did, done with definitely the, did not see Bernie Sanders. Done with the Clinton the triangulation, corruption, total hanging out with Jeffrey Epstein. We're done with the Clintons. That era... Right. Over, thank God. I think that's, that's you know you know I have um, a certain degree of respect for Sanders supporters. I think they're authentic and real. I don't think their policy solutions have proven to work anywhere. But you know there is there are some common grounds there, and we got to get beyond. Obviously, um, I think all three of us agree on this. Probably this extraordinary toxic political environment where you know someone associated with a party is bad just because they're associated with that party. I mean, if that's really what parties have come down to, we had to get rid of parties. I mean, like that's well, like, let's, let's not get crazy here, Mike. I mean, I uh, I like myself a party every so often, so we, well, let's not get the, rid yeah, of more, parties. More, <laughs> more, more social parties, less political parties. Mike. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. Or, or maybe dude. you know, I, I just I, I really struggle because the questions being presented now is obviously you see the enormous damage that's done through partisan politics. And the question arises, aside from honoring tradition, which because there's no constitutional obligation, what 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 is what are parties contributing to at this moment in a constructive way? What are we deriving from them that we wouldn't derive from them if they didn't exist? They certainly, you know, I, I don't know if you've been down to Congress lately, but it, it, the environment down there is unbelievably hostile. I mean, people don't even acknowledge each other or talk to each other. That never existed, even on the most hardened ideological battles, there was a certain congeniality. And the other thing is the, the role of leadership that, you, you know, a lot of, you get a lot of new freshman members coming in right now, and they're going to go down there thinking they're going to change the world and help their districts. And the first conversation they have, whatever party they're with, is with their leadership, who tell them, basically, here's the way it works. And the way it works is, you know, you, you listen to the leadership, and if you do that, you're going to get on the right committees, legislation that you do have will get a vote on the floor and we'll ensure you're not primaried and that you'll be properly funded for your reelection. Now, if you want to go do things your own way, none of those things will happen. And, that, and almost everyone gets that message. Um, and that's not a good message because those people were sent down there to represent those districts and they should be responsive to the voters, to the voters, not to anyone in Washington, D.C. That's right. And, and this is something the left and the right can agree on. The founding fathers did not want political parties because they knew what was going to happen. Once you have political parties come in, that's when the corruption comes in. Uh, yeah, Washington, Washington warned, warned about them, um, obviously, in, in the party address, I believe, um, you know, that they saw uh, danger coming from it. And, you know, it's just, what's the consideration when you're in a party? You know, the first thing you think about is how are my peers in the party going to view this? 
was that really the first? I mean, that's kind of like almost the way you would envision totalitarian societies, the Chinese Communist Party. Right. Do I want to do I want to do politburo functioning? Do I want to amuse my party or do I want to amuse the people who vote for me? Uh, guys, no, uh, not a lot of amusement today, but some really good talk. Uh, David, I love you. Michael, I feel the same. I appreciate both love you guys you, uh, being with us. Thanks. And we're going to need all these points of view as much as possible as we go into this next phase, wherever we're going. But uh, you guys, thanks very much. Have a great weekend. Michael Johns, David Eisenbach, mixed it up for us. And uh, we're going to mix it up right here. Hopefully Vernon Jones is going to join us right after this.